This essay is entitled Mass Consumerism and the Ticking Time Bomb of Indonesia's Global Palm Oil Industry. The modern neoliberal world and its practice of mass globalization has brought goods, people, cultures, languages, and services to all parts of the earth. With this, the intrinsic global commodity chain that has embedded itself within the social and moral fabric of the world's consumers has aided in creating a practice of consumption that has become counterproductive and unsustainable to the producing countries of such products. Palm oil, an ancient staple crop, has emerged as one of these major commodity products on the global market especially with production in Southeast Asia, as individual smallholders and major companies alike rely on profits of growing and producing palm oil for their livelihoods. Unfortunately, this has become a vicious cycle, as the everyday consumer in the anthropogenic era has proven to be blind to the ramifications of the global supply chain of palm oil that is masked by the corrupt undertakings of major corporations and governments. Thus, these practices exploit the underbelly of modern consumerism and regard for sustainable practices, resulting in human rights violations and the exacerbation of environmental decay. Palm oil, also known as Alias guinensis, is known as the world's most popular vegetable oil. As it is relatively cheap to produce, creates an eccentric, creamy texture for foods, and is used in cosmetic and cleaning products as well as in increasingly in biofuels for automobiles and aircraft. These implications of production have given many a means for their livelihoods, especially in Indonesia and other southeastern Asian countries, where there has been increasing development of palm oil plantations over the past two decades. Originating from West and Central Africa, palm oil became prevalent as it was globalized during the British Empire and only recently became significantly prevalent and sought after in Indonesia after the financial crisis in 1998 that plagued Asia. Palm oil entered the market as a healthier substitute for trans fats and is continually mislabeled as vegetable oil, allowing for the possibility that consumers might not even know that palm oil is in the products they buy. Such a product eventually made its way onto the shelves of every grocery store and within the economic diets of nearly every person in the world. This unsuspecting and sometimes innocent consumption, seemingly out of convenience for low costs and comfort, has continuously overlooked a very integrated, corruptive cycle of businesses and government that has not been sustainably maintained or held accountable allowing for the free market, capitalistic hegemon to take full reign and aid in creating major environmental, social, political, and economic adversity. Political Corruption and the Dangers of Big Banks and Businesses The government of Indonesia has been well known for their intrinsic compliance with and manipulation of the unsustainable palm oil industry. As a developing nation, Indonesia's government has been deemed an extractive regime. Gellert notes that extractive regimes, including Indonesia, rely on natural resources for capital accumulation and government revenue. They have proven to be resilient socio-political formations in which resources are deemed necessary for growth, ideologically justifying negative impacts on the people and non-human ecologies affected by their extraction. Starting in the 1960s, the Indonesian New Order regime, reigning from 1966 to 1998, procured vast amounts of forest and deemed them as protected lands. This included large amounts of indigenous and non-indigenous lands, home to millions of people, and the Loiser ecosystem, one of the most diverse ecosystems in the world. Since then, it is reported that these lands have been sold to corporations for the implementation of extractive practices. Johnson notes that after the New Order regime fell, treatment of Indonesian lands and people only became more embedded in the unethical system. Political power was redistributed to regents, also known as bupatis, in local villages where they had full control of the land designations and little respect for their constituents' needs or requests. Even though there are protective land policies in place with Indonesian government, 
the bribery that goes on between businesses and local bupatis to gain easy access to land rights has been rampant and the main driver of illegal land grabbing. However, the Indonesian government is not silent about this. The president of Indonesia, Joko Widodo, pledged time and time again that the Indonesian government would fight the internal problem of corruption. Still, with little being done administratively to counter the problem, numerous, as Johnson deems, opaque countries continue to squeak by and illegally bribe local bupatis and further degrade the land for the profits of palm oil. Journalists and activists who have gone to Indonesia to study and report on the palm oil industries and the corrupt undertakings of local governments have been deported, jailed, and attacked for trying to expose the unethical practices taking place. This post-Washington consensus justifies this analysis, as Gellert mentions that persistent weakness in resource management among resource-dependent states caused many governments to fail. Gellert also mentions that countries with higher resource exports, like Indonesia, are more likely to be associated with harm to national development through lower rates of economic growth, heightened corruption, and authoritarianism. Thus, it is out of the question to believe that the Indonesian government has not been colluding with these unjust practices since little has been done and the forests continue to be stripped of their native people and essential ecosystems. The corruption and unethical practices of production and consumption of the palm oil industry does not stop with the local bupatis and the Indonesian government. As a global system, those who finance and therefore further enable the industry are known to be elite businessmen, major corporations, and banks from around the world. As palm oil uses nearly 10.2 million hectares, or 40,927 square miles of land in Indonesia alone, a majority of palm oil is controlled by only 25 companies. These companies are owned by businessmen, or rather palm oil tycoons from Indonesia, Malaysia, and even the United Kingdom. It has been reported that 14 out of the 30 richest men in Indonesia own businesses or have something to do with palm oil production. Although the bubble that the palm oil industry has created in Southeast Asia has proven very profitable, the merciless way companies treat the resources of this land, for some, this land even being their home, is exceptionally intriguing. Johnson avers that when companies do set aside ecologically sensitive areas within their land banks, they have seen them reallocated by local governments to other companies. This just proves what a vicious cycle occurs, how large the turnover rate is, and how desperate these companies are to find land and quickly profit from it. Another example of this is in Panka's 2018 documentary, where government environmental surveyors are viewing an area of rainforest that was recently torn down. Locals in the area noted that when government oversight is surveying the area, the companies know not to be there, as their deforestation actions are illegal, yet not enforced by the local authorities. However, once the oversight surveyors leave, the companies come back and get to work, sometimes even in the dead calm of night. Major national and foreign banks, including Citibank, BNP Paribas, Hong Kong, and Shanghai Banking Corporation, Credit Suisse, and Rabobank, have been found to facilitate credit to the largest Indonesian oil palm plantations. These investments of businessmen, businesses, and banks are the linking point of the ever-evolving neoliberal global commodity supply chain, which emphasize profit gain and ease over ethical and sustainable consumption policies. Philosopher Noam Chomsky argued that neoliberalism is destroying our democracy as the world has slowly grown into a very individualistic society dominated by hegemonic powers who seek to undermine the governing mechanisms put in place generations ago. Neoliberal theory argues that the economy should be deregulated and privatized. This has increasingly threatened the well-being of many countries, including Indonesia, as politicians, businessmen, and even local farmers are looking for the best next profit. Gellert mentions in his article 
that the expansion of capitalism and neoliberalism has created a political forest which serves as a maze of manipulative and controlling factors to trap those involved and make significant profits. Although neoliberalism is something that cannot necessarily be seen, it impacts the lives of every human being as private investment and management take hold. Gellert explains that these political forests serve to legitimize the allocation of rights to extract, to cultivate, and to export and sell. Gellert further gives the example of Chile, which was one of the first countries to be developed under neoliberal practices for the exportation of natural resources. However, it is also mentioned that, unlike Chile, some extractive regimes, including Indonesia, instead encounter further degradation of society and the stagnation of development, instead of a more Western development with higher incomes per capita and growing levels of consumption. Such deep marketization of capitalistic hegemon within developing countries have thus proven to establish large conflicts shaped by the commodities exported and the operations that surround the production process and supply chain. As Indonesia remains, as Geller describes, the gatekeeper to the free gifts of nature that drive a global industry, it is important to remember that the popular ideologies of modern-day marketization have negative impacts on the transparency and ethically achieved endeavors of underdeveloped nations. Environmental and health impacts, deforestation, climate, and biodiversity damages. Those who live in developed civilizations have seemingly come to view the degradating weight humans have put on nature as out of sight, out of mind, and out of their control. Humans have created boundaries for their own existence, and nature has essentially become the antithesis of human globalization, development, and consumption. The healthy and extravagant habitats that the rainforests of Indonesia, as Rosner notes, provided 10% of the world's known plants, 12% of mammals, and 17% of all known bird species. Such a wide array of biodiversity has seemingly been transformed from a richly dynamic and organic landscape to a mechanistic farm, as tens of thousands of miles are covered row upon row of oil palm trees. As more and more rainforests have been burned and logged for oil palm plantations, the environmental impacts that follow are extraordinary. Creating such land via burning of forests are reported to have created a deficit as the economic cost of forests and land fires in Indonesia in 2015 was $16.3 billion, whereas the added value of all palm oil profits came up only $11.7 billion. The discourses surrounding deforestation are a mix of both populist and managerial discourse when related to the palm oil conflict. The populist standpoint blames big companies and international agendas that finance and fuel their own interests. This discourse paints the indigenous, farmers, and smallholders as victims. The managerial discourse blames slash-and-burn farmers who are forced to expand and degrade the forests because of overpopulation and overconsumption, or production, of products in their country. In this case, we are seeing the apathy of both big businesses and government as they exploit populations and help contribute to pollution and degradation, as well as of smallholder farmers who are simply not aware and were never educated on the environmental degradation they are causing as reported, until recently with developing advocacy and international exploitation of the conflict. Such rampant deforestation has resulted in the removal of some of Indonesia's rainforests, most prized animals, especially the Sumatran orangutan and other animals like the Sumatran tiger and elephant. A large portion of the island of Sumatra includes what is referred to as the Loiser ecosystem, one of the most respected and most diverse ecosystems in the world. However, with many companies illegally coming into these sacred lands, Nantha notes that the orangutan is in a competitive rivalry for land with the palm oil companies. Such major death tolls at an estimated 150,000 orangutans since 1999 have been driving many conservation efforts 
to help save the species that would otherwise be driven to extinction in the area. Such ignorance of the Indonesian government has necessitated the intervention of foreign advocacy and conservation groups to aid in orangutan protection. Although orangutans are not beneficial to humans other than for the purpose of tourism, Nantha notes orangutans are a fruit eater that disperses seeds contributing to forest health and vitality. Healthy forests, in turn, generate localized ecosystem services, such as the provision of clean water and materials and global ones, such as climate regulation through carbon sequestration and storage. Orangutans that are not removed from their home by conservationists are known to be burned to death and even killed by the deforesting workers. Orangutans are also known to be kidnapped, especially babies, and sold on the black market for large amounts of money. They are also known to be taken and kept in small cages in sometimes horrible conditions. This treatment leads to social isolation, resulting in behavioral problems as well as death due to malnourishment. Such blatantly ignored implications that Indonesia's wildlife is going through by major companies and governments, all of which are further enabled by consumer consumption and demand, are further creating this undeniably horrifying predicament for one of humankind's closest relatives. The environmental effects that palm oil production is creating are also contributing to severe pollution and the increase in amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Large swaths of land in Indonesia are considered peatland, which is not to be disturbed at depths deeper than three meters. However, with such large amounts of palm oil encroachment, companies illegally and unethically build palm oil plantations on these peatlands. The practices are known to release large amounts of carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere, as standing forests and underdeveloped peatlands act as important carbon sinks, safely sequestering and storing carbon and aiding in the regulation of global weather patterns. Because of this disruption, Indonesia has become the third largest emitter of these greenhouse gases, just behind the United States and China, with half of their output being directly related to deforestation. Fires started by both local farmers and companies that are set to quickly burn down large amounts of forest have contributed to large amounts of smog and smoke, which have measured 1,300% above the quality threshold of healthy breathing air for humans. The smoke is known to make people dizzy and congested. Children and newborns especially are known to suffer from increased respiratory infections and diseases. Long droughts and the increasing effect of El Nino, estimated to impact the area in the future due to climate change, will worsen the conditions even further. In some villages, the fire emissions, along with the palm oil wastewater, which include large amounts of dangerous fertilizers, have been reported to not only pollute the water, but to also kill papaya fish populations that villagers once relied upon for food. These conditions have forced villagers to be unable to live solely from the nature around them and to essentially submit to the external forces of globalized consumption. Human Livelihood Impacts The Palm Oil Industry's Relationship with Communities and Employment The palm oil industry in Indonesia has economically benefited many individuals and villages, bringing them, as Rosner notes, paved roads, better schooling, and satellite television. The Indonesian government has implemented the palm oil industry in hopes of creating rural socioeconomic development. Rist notes, in all locations, communities have growing monetary aspirations, desiring a regular source of income to secure greater access to education and health care, as well as to purchase motorbikes and electronic goods. Farmers who see that their land is of little use or value are solicited and encouraged to transfer their land to an oil palm company to make money. One resident exclaimed, I want to change my fate now. With oil palm, I'll get a regular income, with the company doing all the work. Another method of palm oil production is through individual farmers, through what is deemed small holding, which takes up nearly half of palm oil agriculture in Indonesia. Although this practice has proven much more difficult, as some smallholders are increasingly driven to sell their land due to the high costs of maintenance, 
they have proven that with enough land at a minimum five acres, they are able to provide for their families and stay above the poverty line. Unfortunately, with the rampant corruption and manipulation of the government and businesses, smallholders have often been met empty-handed with the unkept promises the government and major corporations made to their communities. Conflict among communities, as well as indigenous groups, especially the Asinese people, have been on the rise against the institutional hegemons. It is noted that palm oil companies have sometimes bulldozed entire indigenous villages, leaving their residents homeless and reliant on government handouts. Local protesters stuck in the conflict have gone as far as confiscating excavators from palm oil companies and set them on fire, making them unusable, as well as going onto company land and cutting down the oil palm trees. Large amounts of land disputes and human rights violations have been recorded in some areas. Although major companies are aware, they continue to get their palm oil from plantations that practice such horrendous acts. Human rights and labor violations regarding employment through major palm oil producing companies has also played a major factor on the livelihoods of Indonesians. Working conditions of individuals in the palm oil plantations are known to be especially tough and even dangerous, especially for women. Panka notes that female workers that have even worked in the fields for seven or more years are still kept as freelancers, or what is also known as care net workers. Thus, they have no rights for food allowances, health insurance, or paid leave. Female workers primarily spend their time spraying fertilizer and cutting old branches for 12 hours or longer every day. If their daily work is not finished, their wages will be reduced. One woman noted that some days she is paid $7 a day and sometimes only $1 a day. The quota system that plantation supervisors expect of their workers is beyond ethical standards, which even resulted in the implementation of child labor, with some of the youngest being only 8 years old. Colchester notes, little training on the safe use and potential risks of these chemicals is made available to palm oil workers, compounded with poor medical facilities, lack of suitable protective equipment, and the weak or non-existent implementation of safety regulations. Colchester notes further, health risks from chemicals in the fertilizer, such as paraquat, are known to cause severe poisoning if inhaled, exposed to skin, or ingested. It is also noted in Colchester's article that as women are paid such low incomes, they result to prostitution, leading to higher amounts of STDs and HIV AIDS among plantation workers. Workers are also known to be trapped working on such plantations, as they are sometimes trafficked and enslaved, as passports are seized, and as they are held in a perpetual state of debt bondage. Such precarious working conditions and employment practices, as mentioned, have been found with the largest palm oil companies in Indonesia, Indofood. It is noted that Indofood's response has been to deny the problems on its plantations or to adopt cosmetic fixes that fail to address the root cause of labor issues. Although Indofood is such a large company and they are being surrounded by such a conflict as palm oil, they still are the largest company with a no deforestation, no peatland, and no exploitation policy. As a result, the company has recently been sanctioned by RSPO, which is the Round Table on Sustainable Palm Oil policy. This system that we see in the unethical production of palm oil is merely a cycle that is blatantly clear in the context of the palm oil industry. More demand from consumers causes more demand from companies, which in turn makes them more willing to use unethical standards for cheaper production and have a larger incentive for the use of slave labor and unsustainable production practices, all with the help of the government. Advocacy and Implementation of Sustainable Palm Oil Production as difficult conditions and conflicts linger in the forests of Indonesia, calls for help from around the world have been heard, and the demand for sustainable practices has spread. As only 3% of the world's palm oil is certified sustainable, governments and businesses alike continue to make promises that are often left unmet. For example, 
Ro explains how the Indonesian government has promised that they will be going after the illegal loggers and farmers, but nothing substantial has occurred as it is very difficult to track the supply chain of unsustainably produced palm oil that is intermixed with sustainably produced. It has been observed that the certification process of palm oil done by the RSPO, as VJ notes, has been criticized has been criticized as insufficient from an environmental perspective. There are concerns about the sources of palm oil that lack certification, much of which is processed or traded by RSPO member companies and sold in the global marketplace. Therefore, the certification process of the RSPO is continually overlooked and ignored by major companies as buyers accept all farmers' fruits no matter their history. Johnson very intelligently notes these developments are a stark reminder of the challenges of transforming an industry and, above all, the dangers of reliance on voluntary commitments. However, an example of a company that did make the right decisions is called Lyman Agro on the island of Borneo in Indonesia. Law notes that the company built roads, schools, and health clinics that have been billed as proof of the company's commitment to its social responsibility. Non-governmental organizations have also increasingly held companies responsible for addressing the issue of the conflict and to commit to a zero deforestation business plan for years to come. Johnson notes that as a result of this, the world's biggest palm oil growers, traders, and buyers are now on board with what on paper suggests a new dawn. Advocacy groups like Wild Asia have deployed to Indonesian areas to teach smallholders, palm oil companies, and the public how to successfully produce palm oil more sustainably. Another advocacy group called Rainforest Action Network has set out to expose and hold accountable the major companies that exploit unsustainable practices. Such uprisings of environmental justice have now given those affected a new voice and to finally hold those responsible accountable for their actions. Many companies still remain in the unethical playing field of utilizing palm oil that is not 100% ethical palm oil. Such companies include Ferrero, PepsiCo, Nestle, Wilmar, Mars, Hershey's, and General Mills. In 2018, environmentalists came to terms with the Indonesian government. President Wododo signed a moratorium for a three-year suspension of palm oil distributor licensing and an overview of palm oil plantation practices across the nation. However, this issue is still developing, and locals are skeptical as to whether their government will act accordingly. It is believed that Indonesia is hitting a breaking point, where President Wododo and the Indonesian government is now more likely to act as the environmental and thus human repercussions of the palm oil industry are now significantly affecting Indonesian economy, business, and travel. Mass consumption and further demand for palm oil has drastically changed the political ecology of the Indonesian populace, which has completely changed the human race's relationship with nature. The human exploitation and unknowing consumption of resources has proven not always to be a good thing. There are larger, more intricate global concerns that are hidden behind the leaves of the forest, the products in the grocery aisle, and the promises of major companies and governments. If we truly live in a global community, it is our duty to protect our resources and use them wisely not just to feed the free market capitalistic hegemon. The fact that many in this world go on with a business as usual order and give little thought to the impacts they are making on the environment has proven to be detrimental to humankind. As Jane Goodall once said, the greatest danger to our future is apathy. This statement rings just as true for the treatment of endangered species, degraded forests, and the climate as it does for the fair treatment of humans and the human condition.